now it is time for the main event of the evening, and it's time for me to introduce our special guest speaker tonight. The guy's got a resume. I could spend the whole night just talking about some of the stuff he's done. He had a, a number one uh, hit single in, in a group he was in in the 60s. Uh, he was a former full contact fighter with, I think, like 200 fights. He's written books. He's got a PhD. He was the president of a national chain of mental health and treatment clinics. He was on the radio, and all and on and on and on. Do me a favor, give it up for Dr. Mike Marino. some of the highest things that we possibly could. And those of you that know me know that I would never say or do anything, I would try to never say or do anything that would disrespect the very serious and solemn work that we do in here. So this guy walks into a bar. <laughs> and the bouncer says, excuse me, sir, you can't come in here without a tie. The guy says, okay. Goes back to his car, pops the trunk, takes out the jumper cable, puts him around his neck, ties a bow, walks back to the bar. Says, okay, can I come in now? Bouncer says, okay, but don't start anything. You have to explain it to them. The jumper cables. Man. One of the questions I'm asked all the time is why do people start using drugs and alcohol? Many years ago, First Lady Nancy Reagan had a very well-intentioned but not very successful campaign called Just Say No, like it was that easy. Just say no, I'm not going to do that. But we know that the end of the picture isn't very happy, so why do people start? Why do people use abuse and ultimately become addicted to drugs? Because it's fun? Well, you know and I know that that fun period doesn't last too long, and after a relatively short period of time, you're just using so you don't feel sick. So I don't think the fun part of it uh, holds water. My observation has been, and my contention is, that people use abuse and ultimately become addicted to drugs and alcohol because there's something broken inside that needs fixing. Something that they're trying to medicate, some very deep pain or wound. Let me tell you something, you can take an addict and you can chain them to a fence for 30 or 60 days and they will get sober. You're not going to stay sober unless you address this deep wound, this thing that you're trying to medicate inside. You're not going to have a successful recovery program, and that's what I want to talk about tonight: living life on a little higher plane. How to get from here to there? Now, before we do that, uh, I want to take you on a little walk down memory lane. Uh, many of you know that I was in show business for a lot of my early life. In fact, I started at a very young age. By the time I was five, I was singing and tap dancing on TV and just any place uh, that we could find to perform. Uh, my mother would take me. I had one of those real pushy stage mothers who used to dress me up in these ridiculous outfits and take me out to perform. Let me give you a little sample of what that looks like. There I am. Now, I didn't notice it until I came here tonight and saw it on the big screen, but it looks like my fly is open here. <laughs> so thanks, Mom. A little extra embarrassment. But as the years went on, I progressed and was in a lot of bands. And by the time I was about 19, I looked like this. This is what I looked like with a hairpiece. And uh, thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. I'm going to the hair club for men tomorrow. Uh, 
But I discovered that being in a band and being a singer and a performer was a great way to meet women. And I used to think that they would just be so attracted to us because we were such good singers and such dynamic performers and because we were so charismatic and had such a powerful presence. But what I really think now, looking back, is they were attracted to the costumes that we wore. Must <laughs> be down front with the green lapels. You like that? You like the green lapel look? I was going to wear that tonight, actually. <laughs> but I couldn't find it. Here's another one. We look like the flying wall enders. <laughs> down there on the right. I want to show you a picture of another band that I was not in. This is the original Tommy James and the Shondells. Tommy James is in the center there. Many of you would remember Tommy James and the Shondells. You remember their first big hit? My baby does the hanky panky. Oh, you're singing along already. You remember, beautiful. My baby does the hanky panky. We had such deep, meaningful lyrics in those days. Do you remember the verse of that song? You probably do. See if this makes any sense to you. I saw her walking on down the line. You know I saw her for the very first time. A pretty little girl standing all alone. Hey, pretty baby, can I take you home? I never saw her, never, never saw her, no. <laughs> so did you see her? Did you not see her? What were you doing when you wrote that song? I don't know, but Tommy James went on to have a bunch of hit records. But this is the original band, and I show you this picture for this reason. Kneeling, Tommy's in the center standing up, but kneeling down front to your left is a, a kid named Craig Villeneuve, and he was the piano player of the original band. He played the piano on that record, and he thank you. Now, I want to fast forward about 12 years to one of my bands, and I'm on there on the upper right, and Craig is kneeling down in the front with the beard. That's Craig Villeneuve. He looks a lot older. And I had hired him ostensibly because he had been in Tommy James and Shondells, and I thought that was kind of a cool thing to have a guy in that band that had been in that band. But the first thing I noticed about Craig was that he had a very, very unusual body. We got together for a week and rehearsed before we went out on the road. And I, I, this guy was walking around. He had this weird kind of pot belly, this weird kind of gut thing going on. Uh, not like a normal one, almost like he was pregnant his distended belly. And I used to think it was because Craig drank so much water. And that's maybe where he kept his water weight because he was always walking around with a 12-ounce glass full of water. Well, it wasn't too many days until I realized that that was actually a glass full of vodka. And Craig was an alcoholic. And Craig was uh, in the last stages of cirrhosis of the liver. But I was young and stupid and I didn't know anything about addiction at that time. And so we're out on the road and we're playing and I would get so frustrated with Craig because he couldn't remember his parts and he was a good, good piano player, good singer and I'd be like, man, we do these songs every stinking night. Why can't you remember what to do? Of course, he was a very sick guy and he was drunk all the time. But you wouldn't know him to look at him. Um, so during that time period, I got uh, a call. I met the guys in the McCoys, the group Hang On Sloopy that you heard there. And they asked if I wanted to join the band. And I was thinking, oh yeah, this would be a great relief. I could you know, be an employee again instead of being a leader and having to babysit this alcoholic keyboard player. So I disbanded my band. And I remember the last night that we performed together, this band, was in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And Craig was really messing up that night. And I was exceedingly irritated with him. And so when we were done, it was time to get our stuff out of there and go, Craig is fooling around and he's talking to a customer and the last thing I remember him doing is letting the customer buy him a drink and he ordered his usual triple vodka on the rocks. And I was not nice to him. And I felt really bad about it. So we went our separate ways. And about a month later I was with the McCoys and we were playing at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. And I thought, well I'll give Craig a call. I really owe the guy an apology. You know, I should have cut him some slack. And so I called his parents' home in Indiana, where he lived, and his mother answered the phone. And I said, uh, hi, is Craig there? This is Mike Marino. And she said, oh, Mike, we lost Craig. I said, you lost him? I said, yeah, he died. And I'm thinking, wow, just a few weeks before this guy dies, I'm yelling at him because he doesn't pack up the band long enough because he's talking to a customer. I was so insensitive to what he was going through 
and so ignorant about what drugs and alcohol do to you that I didn't understand that this guy was in the last few weeks of his life. But when I hung up that phone with his mom, it became very clear to me from that day to this day right now that drug and alcohol use, abuse, and addiction is a life and death proposition. And let me underscore that by telling you this. Craig is down there in the front with the beard, deceased. See the guy in the middle? Jim Fears in Osha, Wisconsin, deceased. See the guy in the upper left there? J.D. Sanchez, wonderful drummer, played with Morris Day in the time. Sheila E., Sheena Easton, deceased. They're all gone. Drug and alcohol addiction is a life and death proposition. So today, I want to talk with you about living life on a little higher plane that will lead you into recovery, that will lead you into hope, that will lead you into purpose. The first thing that I want you to consider is the word voice. And I know you're working with step 11 and you're thinking about these things, and these are all things you can be thinking about, praying about, meditating in the days to come. One of the most common things I hear from people who are struggling with drug and alcohol addiction is they feel like they don't have a voice in life, that life just happens to them, that they are the victim of stuff. And this is what they're doing to meditate their pain. And it may be true that you are a legitimate victim of some very horrific things, but that lifestyle is not going to serve you well in your recovery. A lot of times you feel just like, I've never had a voice. So let's talk about what we can do about it. Because our goal here, as we work through the recovery process at a higher level, would be to develop an adult or a mature voice. One that says, I like this. I don't like that. I'm okay with this. I'm not okay with that. No, sorry. I can set some boundaries. We want to develop an adult and mature voice. That will help you out in your recovery program. So let's think about what a mature voice looks like. The first thing about a mature voice is a mature voice thinks before it speaks. Now when you're using, you don't always do a good job of this. I think you know what I'm talking about. Now the thing that helps you, uh, the part of your brain that helps you think before you speak is called the prefrontal cortex, this part up here. This is the executive decision part of your brain. It is the most thoughtful and human part of your brain, and it's where you get your impulse control. Now, do you think your impulse control might be impaired when you're using? Well, of course it is. Now, a lot of you know that I worked for several years with Dr. Daniel Amen who is uh, the world leader in nuclear brain imaging. So I've looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of brains. Let me show you what a brain scan looks like of a normal brain. Uh, this is looking from the top down. In the front of your brain, the prefrontal cortex would be for the ceiling there. And this, is, uh, looks at the sur this scan looks at the surface of the brain, and it measures blood flow and activity. Now, do you think using alcohol affects your brain function? Well, there's an alcohol kind of Let's take a look at the prefrontal cortex there. <laughs> the prefrontal cortex is affected by alcohol use. Certainly methamphetamine yes. is not doing any good. What about marijuana? People say marijuana, well that's you know that's kind of a harmless thing. We should just legalize it. You know, this is what a marijuana brain looks like. <laughs> so you're not at the top of your game <laughs> when you're using it. I mean, you're good at eating Cheetos. <laughs> awesome. That impulse control thing is, is a little bit impaired. Now, I have some good news for you. Uh, in the last decade or so, there's been some really great research out, and unlike we once thought, the brain has a remarkable ability, a remarkable ability to repair itself. So if you stop using it and make some healthy choices in your life, here's a couple years of sobriety. Big improvement, huh? Big improvement. So a mature voice thinks before it speaks. And if you help your brain function well, you will have a better ability to think before you speak, and your mouth won't get you into so much trouble. Another thing about a mature voice is a mature voice uses an economy of words. When you over-explain everything to try to justify your position in life, people don't believe you. You know, there's a, a great line from a Shakespearean play, Hamlet. It's often misquoted, but what the line really says is, the lady doth protesteth to 